Geraldine Perry, we call her Jerry. And Geraldine's been involved with AMI for a long time. She lives just southwest of Chicago. And um, Geraldine is a co-author of The Two Faces of Money, among other books, and is the, also the author of Climate Change, Land Use, and Monetary Policy, The New Trifecta. Which is, we've been covering that today. And so uh, Jerry is also um, has written numerous articles on the web and two chapters from her upcoming book, Ghost of Our Grandfather, Echoes from the Northern Plains, provide material for her presentation this year on 19th century populists and the money question. The presentation will focus on some of the more surprising lessons from mon modern monetary thinkers that were provided by the 19th century populists. She begins with a short summary of who the populists were and from whence they came then moves into a discussion of how they define the money question in their own words. The money question in particular led to charges leveled against them that included a tendency toward conspiracy, overblown rhetoric and paranoia. It will be left to the audience to decide the extent to which these charges were accurate and the extent to which they were counter-propaganda waged by the opposition. Please give a warm welcome to Geraldine Perry. Yay, Geraldine! Um, okay, so this is sort of working. It's cropped for whatever reason. Um, like I said, it's a, a little overly long, and I needed the, some of these too because I've got some quotes. But anyway, we're going to get started with, we're going to focus on the money question. I want to do a brief history, but it's probably going to be a little longer than you assume. Um, it is about the money question, but the first slide, uh, there's a, a was a popular cartoon by a, a cartoonist named Punk from the period. And you've got William Jennings Bryan um, as the head of the populist snake um, in the process of devouring the um, Democratic Party. So it's a little bit of, um, uh, you know, a depiction of what was going on in terms of this third party movement. So. Is that the 1896 election? This was the 1896 election. That was the peak, considered the peak of the um, populace. And so now, good. <laughs> this is not even working the way of, hmm. all right. Yeah. We should get down there. Right, but it's not, for whatever reason, all right, the populist, who they were. I, I, have, I have a couple of graphs. Just keep going. Okay, thanks. What would I do without some technical? I'm, I'm worse than Joe with technical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Anyhow, so who were the populists? Well, first of all, uh, this is, was a, a hard question when you have to consider the year and uh, sometimes the month and the day. But most little key populists after 1892 were members of the People's Party, most but not all, also known as the Populist Party. They included people from all walks of life, everywhere from farmers and cotton pickers to even economists were at least small populists. Um, and one um, group that probably would be worth looking into better would be the American Economics Association because they were trying to um, uh, uh, legitimize what the populists were teaching. Okay, but obviously the largest group within the populist uh, party was going to be the farmers from the farmers alliances and I use that um, plural of the alliances plural on purpose. So what uh, kind of a, a metaphor for the times was this sketch of, uh, it's called People to Plutocracy or Labor versus Greed, and it was part of a worldwide movement. And to me, the populist era kind of represents um, or, or parallels what's happening today, only what's happening today is kind of in hyperdrive from what the populist era was. And it was bad enough back then, as I think you're going to see in a second. Just a little background from where they came, uh, how they, they popped up. Um, their lineage traces back, really, to the Civil War. Uh, and there are two big groups, the National uh, Grange of Patrons of Husbandry and the National Labor Unions. So it was labor 
and farmers uh, that were coming up and you had literally hundreds of groups that were springing up from those two organizations. So it gets a little confusing at times, but um, the ones that we're most familiar with were, was the Greenback Party, uh, the Knights of Labor, and of course the Farmers Alliances. Uh, the thing is, the Populist, or the People's Party, had its origins in South Dakota and Kansas in 1890. So that's two years before the People's Party was officially launched on a national level. South Dakota actually came in first, a week ahead of um, Kansas. South Dakota launched, launched the, independent, the, third party, the independent party a week ahead, and it was they had to accept the Farmers Alliance platforms. Um, that party uh, before they'd get the support of the, and it was, this effort was led by a fellow named Henry Luce, you're gonna hear a little bit more about. The Kansans um, uh, started the Populist Party a week later, okay? Uh, so what we, so all these groups, we've got hundreds of groups being formed um, in the United States, third parties, anti-monopoly party, uh, union labor party, there was, I don't know, dozens of them. Uh, what happened was they were, they didn't just, you know, start forming for no reason, just like today, we've got all of these um, efforts to right the wrongs of the system. Uh, you know, you go and protest the, the XL pipeline and all kinds of stuff. Uh, anyway, these groups were formed in response to uh, specifically the reductions that were occurring in the money supply um, that occurred right after the Civil War. In, and I said the lawful money supply because at that time, lawful money was gold and silver, um, greenbacks, two different kinds of greenbacks, and to a limited extent, the national bank notes because according to Del Mar, those bank notes couldn't be exchanged, they weren't exchangeable between individuals. So they had li limited legal tender value. Um, anyway, the leadership of both the Democratic and Republican parties, same as today, would support these um, lawful money, uh, you know, the restrictions, no matter what the populace said, they were supporting these restrictions in the money supply. So the question for us today, obviously, but it was for the populace as well, should the nation's money supply be controlled by private interests or the sovereign government? So we've got, I've got here, hopefully you can see that. This is a graph that um, was part of the booklet we were studying, our parity research group was studying this year. Uh, it was prepared uh, as part of a report by the U.S. Senate Agricultural Committee uh, to the 75th Congress about 1938. Uh, and what it shows is the 100 cent dollar was in short supply from the beginning, uh, you know, 1800 all the way through to the time of the report. Um, and you can see uh, 1800, the, it's following in a close uh, line with the, I can't use the, but there's a hundred, hundred line marked a hundred. That's where, when those two lines, dollar value is the uh, top values that were going along during those years from 1800 to 1938. Oh. You can't see the dates underneath, Jerry. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can get it. Yeah, okay. Can, I don't know, are they big enough to read? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you've got that line right there. And when dollar value met that top line and the bottom line commodity value met at that 100 mark or in a reasonable trading rate, you know, proximity of that line, you had what's called a 100 cent dollar, a stable dollar that, you know, you could ch exchange um, your goods and products for. Uh, but it, you can see from this bubble, in 1896, that big, huge bubble, that's the peak of it is 1896. So the dollar value was up at $2.35, and the, the uh, commodity value was down in lower than it's ever been, even during the Great Depression, at 46 cents per unit. So I think that probably could be sort of on a par with what's going on today. Um, Anyway, but at least for the dollar value, what they were doing was it was getting we were getting a dear dollar because they were um, deliberately contracting the money supply. So um, 
I thought that they, what they were doing, they, the, this report was showing that the value of the dollar is going to control prices and prices would per, control income and prosperity. So where uh, the populists were accused by the opposition of being, you know, uneducated, hasty farmers who didn't know, you know, what the heck they were talking about, but they were surprisingly well-educated. Most of them were self-educated, um, but surprisingly well-read. And so they drew their information from ancient authorities like Oden, who was cited in the mixed money case of 1604 as an authority, uh, Pliny, David Ricardo, all of these guys, together with a plethora of contemporary authorities and lots of government data. They also, you can hear it in their language, we're gonna go over that in a couple minutes, they understood what the founding generation said about money. Um, and they probably knew that the reason the British ban on what the British call public money was not included in the list of complaints against the king in the Declaration of Independence uh, was because the British Parliament had reversed that ban on public money about a year before. And so um, the, the British said, okay guys, you can go ahead and issue your public money for the public benefit and, and use it as legal tender. Uh, I, I couldn't prove that, but I, in there, in some of these quotes, you're gonna see that uh, they didn't know what the founders had said about money. Um, both founders and pub, uh, populace, of course, understood that public money didn't have to be gold or silver. Um, and because they read their history, including the mixed money case. And so here we have our favorite guy, <laughs> Alexander Hamilton, who uh, of course started the first National Bank of the United States and a few other banks. Um, and he's saying, he's telling you, it's immaterial what serves the purpose of money, paper, gold, or silver. You know, the effect of both uh, upon, the, upon the industry is the same. And you can start hearing a little bit about a car exchange um, uh, economy coming through in this next phrase, but he says the intrinsic wealth of the nation is to be measured not by the uh, abundance of precious metals contained in it, but by the quantity of, it, of the productions of its labor and industry. Thomas Jefferson, and he's in France while well, he's um, answering questions posed to him by a, a French author um, about the American money, monetary system. It's about 1789. And so he says, well, whenever the state legislatures lay enough taxes um, so that those legislatures can pay their bills punctually, then paper money is in high, as high as estimation as gold and silver. Because that was the argument for the populace and the founders. Okay, and then, then he says another one. He's got a lot of good ones. But he said another in answer to another question from this guy. Those who talk of bankruptcy of the United States are two, of two descriptions. One. Um, strangers who do not understand the nature and history of our paper money, and two, holders of that paper money who do not wish that the world should understand it. So um, you get a little bit of the international impact of the money system in that, what he's replying to that fellow. You also get a little bit of the subterfuge that's being used to undermine, undermine um, uh, public, I'm gonna call it public money for the time being. Uh, the uh, founders and the populace had objections, major objections, to what they called bank paper. So when you read some of their, their quotes, they'll sometimes refer to bank paper just as paper. So you have to read the context of what they're saying. Um, we call it bank money, a lot of us do anyway. Uh, so we've got a, a couple of them. Here we've got uh, Senator William McClay of Pennsylvania, he's writing in his diary um, on the eve of the vote for Hamilton's bank. And so he says, considered as an aristocratic engine, I have no great predilection for the banks. They may be considered in some measure as operating like a tax in favor of the rich against the poor, tending to the accumulation of money in a few hands, and under this view may be regarded as opposed to republicanism. So, um, you know, he's got it, you're gonna hear it in the populace, another guy, also, John Taylor of Ter Caroline wrote a lot on money. In 1794, he says basically the same thing, uh, bank money is in its best view only a fraud whereby the imposition of paying interest on a circulating medium um, 
labor suffers on, uh, by the, uh, the imposition of paying interest on the circulating medium. John Taylor Caroline and Thomas Jefferson also talked about what would happen to the system. Um, I guess, I think Michael Hudson calls it the loss of increase, and I call it the law of exponential, uh, mathematical law of exponential growth. Anyway, here he's telling us, uh, he's saying if nothing changes after 1808, no more banks, and you know, no more acquisition of these banks, then the $5 million collected annually by the existing banks at compound interest will carry from the public to the corporations in 20 years about $184 million. Here is already, 1808, is already a vast current of money and power running one way. So that's what, I, in my opinion, Hamilton's bank did to us. Jefferson, in a letter, a famous letter, to John Epps in 1813. John Epps was his um, son-in-law, and he was on the banking committee. They were trying to get rid of the, the bank. Um, and he's comparing, Jefferson is comparing the Continentals, which he said the object of the Continentals was the holy one. It was our liberties and our independence. The object of bank money was to enrich swindlers at the expense of the honest and industrious part of the nation. Okay, and then we get James Madison. So we're talking about undermining the Continental. So, and they under, the populace understood firsthand what the um, James Madison was saying in his 1779 report on money, when he says that there were a combination of enemies of, um, employing every artifice to disparage the Continental uh, currency. And I have some of that history up on my website uh, under American Str uh, Struggle. And uh, it's taken from the founders, but also from Alexander Del Mar. A lot, some of it's from Zarlina, but that comes in a little later. Okay, so now we get to the timeline of the farmers' alliances, north and south. And this is important because they were radically different groups, north and south. And, this, and it, it makes a difference in the, uh, their, their interpretations of money. Okay, the National Farmers Alliance was actually started in Chicago by a guy named Milton George, um, and he called it the National Farmers Alliance. Later it was known, uh, referred to as the Northern Alliance, and sometimes the Northwest Alliance. Um, it spread quickly. Minnesota and Nebraska, who were already states, adopted the state charter of that alliance in like a year later. Um, the thing about this uh, Northern Alliance, I'm gonna call it now, um, that differed from the Southern Alliance, markedly different, was first, that it was open uh, to anyone born on a farm. Membership could be, include blacks, women, and laborers. Also, the Northern Alliance was openly political and non-secret, unlike the Southern Alliance, which had a highly centralized um, method of controlling its, its um, chapters or uh, groups. So in the, the Northern Alliance, actually by 1882, uh, had a membership of 100,000 farmers. And this might have included um, the, I think it was called the Grand State Alliance in Texas. I don't know that. Um, this is from Hicks, and Goodwin says that, that uh, the Southern Alliance achieved that number, I think in 1887 or something like that. But I, I mean, this is, Hicks is saying this for the Northern Alliance in 1882, by, there was a guy in South Dakota uh, by the name of Henry Lukes, um, who in, by 18, South Dakota was still territory. It was not, uh, they weren't separate states. And so he was elected in January of 86 as president of the Dakota Territorial Alliance. When the, the two states became separated, then he was elected president uh, of the South Dakota Alliance. And sometime during that pre period, he was also elected president of the National Farmers Alliance, AKA Northern Alliance. So then we get to the Southern Alliance. Their origins traded, uh, traced to the, a group that called themselves the Knights of the Alliance, started in Lampasas, Lampas, Texas around 1875. What they were trying to do really was uh, uh, oppose, uh, find ways to, to present um, opposition to land sharks and cattle barons. Um, and uh, who were basically riding roughshod over the rights of small farmers. By 1878, a couple years later, they changed their name to the Grand State Alliance, 
but they collapsed when some members attempted to lead the, that organization into the Greenback Party. The word Greenback was associated with the vibrational organization that had formed after the Civil War um, with the Greenbacks and Republicans who were helping to get blacks elected to public office throughout the South. So that had a bad connotation for them. Uh, by 1880, some of the members, not all of them, these, you know, the, they were, the, some of the members were saying, let's do this. The Greenback Party was moving into, the, along with the Knights of Labor, were trying to organize the South. Uh, by 1883, the remnants of that group uh, incorporated um, as the Texas uh, Farmer State Alliance. But it kept itself, at least um, theoretically, as a non-political secret or organization composed of white men. Um, by then, also, so by uh, August of 1886, remember, Lukes is elected president of the um, Dakota Alliance in 18, uh, January of 86. There's something in Texas, in the, with the Southern Alliance, the, the Texas Farmers Alliance, actually, uh, the, something known as the Claiborne Demands um, that were drawn up by the majority. There was a problem, though, because the minority wouldn't go along with it, so the president, Andrew Dunlap, <coughs> resigns a couple months later in December, along with the minority, and they create a big hubbub over it. Um, their main objection was the Greenback plan and secondarily the threat, the emotional tie to the Southern Democrats' white supremacy ideology. Some of them just couldn't get, um, get over that. So McClune, Charles McCune assumes Dunlap's role as president and immediately begins to draw plans for a Southern alliance that was separate and independent from the National Farmers Alliance, AKA Northern Alliance. Before this, the Texas State Farmers Alliance was part of, considered part of that. Northern group, but he doesn't want that. So he, he, what he does is a couple months later, he completes a merger with the Louisiana Farmers Alliance, um, and then he changed the name. And so this is a research study all by itself. Now the name is uh, National Farmers Alliance and Cooperative Union. And it would be, henceforth, introduced as, in McCune's words, um, strictly white man's non-political business organization. Um, by 1888, he arranges another merger with the Agricultural Wheel that had a membership of 500,000 members, so he was moving quickly. The group now becomes known as the Farmers and Laborers Union. There were also, in 86, two colored farmers alliances formed in Texas. One is, I don't know coincidentally or not, called the Colored Farmers Alliance and Cooperative Union, similar to McCune's title. But the two groups merged um, in 1890 and they had a membership of, estimated membership, of around 1.5 million. You find different, um, different numbers, but they were a significant um, uh, force within the alliances. And that was one of the, the tug of wars in the leadership. Um, so anyhow, the, the thing that I found interesting about these um, farmers, the black farmers, they were made up primarily of landless people who picked cotton for the um, white farmers. There were, the South, the South had a, a hierarchy of farmers. So you had still the remnants of the plantation owners, and then you had um, some landowners that were typical farms, and then it, it, it went down from there until you got to these, um, these landless people who picked cotton. And a little bit later, they become, along with white farmers, sharecroppers, which is basically a system of debt peonage. We get to the St. Louis Convention, December of 89. Um, and they meet, the both North and South alliances meet at the in St. Louis, but in separate halls, and what they want to do is consolidate. They want to find a way to get together. Um, differences ran mostly along sectional lines, and this is important, it'll figure in later. Secrecy, black membership, political advocacy, advocacy and the greenback were the, the lines that split them. Um, also, on the last day of uh, that uh, convention, there was a committee of alliance leaders that was appointed to draw up a sub-treasury plan, and that's, uh, I'm not gonna go into it, but real deeply, but it was basically a way to get more greenbacks into circulation based on um, non-perishable crops. Uh, but anyway, it was then at the end of the convention, the very end, um, introduced by McCune. So there was leaders like Luke and Polk, you meet in a second, 
and other alliance leaders who approved of that um, sub-treasury plan, but the, it met with opposition from the Northern Farmers and Knights of, Labor, Knights of Labor. They agreed to it, but only with reluctance. Uh, oddly, a couple years later, um, the uh, populace in name only, but like Pitchfork, Ben Tillman, and some other radical, weird people, um, uh, opposed it, and they said, you know, they, they made all kinds of charges against it. it they were empty charges, but um, they had their own agenda, uh, and that was basically to take down the Bourbon Democrats, um, the gold boy Democrat, uh, Democrats. They didn't want anything to do with the Green Bay. Okay, um, so they did figure out how to consolidate on all those differences except the Southern demand for secrecy. They didn't, the Northern Alliance wouldn't go along with it. Um, so they left. Probably the majority of those guys left. Um, and, but South Dakota, Kansas, and North Dakota um, actually opted to give up their membership in the Northern Alliance and join a newly formed organization. It's not any longer under Charles McCune. It's called the National Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union, but it was frequently referred to as the Southern Alliance. That's why it gets all really confusing. Um, and I'm saying, positing here, that it was actually under the uh, leadership of Leonidas Polk and Henry Luce, not Charles McCune, that the Southern Farmers Alliance, AKA National Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union, became the most important non-political and inclusive organization involved in the founding of the People's Party, AKA Populist Party. So we, here we've got the key players, McCune, was president of the National Farmers Alliance and Cooperative Union from December, and then he named it, named it the Farmers and Laborers Union in 88. So he had two different names for the same organization. He was president from 86 to 88. Um, he was forced out by this fellow, uh, Leonidas Pope of North Carolina, which that state and Virginia tried to um, uh, uh, navigate their way through a biracial um, uh, system, whereas Texas was, there was too many um, that were wedded to the Southern Democratic Party to make that really that viable. There was all kinds of threats with these people um, that wanted to support the populace. Anyway, Luke's, uh, uh, Polk is reelected in the eight, so what they, Polk's is, uh, McCune is shoved out over the dis differences that I, I, I cited before. Uh, uh, it was a strategic um, move to get this organization more um, inclusive, uh, including um, blacks and, and, and the Greenback uh, platform. So he's, he's very popular. This guy was gonna be uh, considered to be um, a, a presidential candidate for the um, populist nominee in 1892. Unfortunately, he died, like just weeks before the convention, of uh, uh, suddenly. And so what happens is Henry Lukes, who's vice president of that organization, assumes the presidency. Lukes is then reelected in December of 1892 amidst a storm of controversy over McCune's many misdeeds. Um, and he was asked, Lukes was asked by the Alliance to write a textbook, and uh, which he did. The first edition was published in 1893 and the second in 1895. It was called the New Monetary System as Advocated by the National Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union. And in chapter four, this is what it says, either gold, silver, nickel, copper, or paper is money until the fiat of government is stamped upon it, and when that's done, it assumes a legal value regardless of its commodity value. He continues toward the end of that chapter, he says, and you're gonna hear a little bit of the idea of par exchange, um, he says, the Farmers Alliance, together with 21 other farm and labor organizations, demand that the government shall make and issue the money the people need, a full legal tender for all debts, public and private, and in sufficient volume to do the business of the country on a cash basis. That is, exchange the products of labor on a cash basis. And here we come with the founders. All charges for the use of money to exchange the products of labor is a tax on and paid by labor. A limited supply enables the user who owns the money to extract such rates for its use as to rob labor of its just reward. We get to Omaha, 1892. Um, the, the People's Party is actually launched in, launched in February. 
but in, it unveiled um, the Omaha Convention, uh, where it was where the uh, platform and the list of candidates was um, unveiled. Interesting here is that just before the Demo uh, the just days before this convention, the populace asked the Democratic Party to accept the demands in its platform, and uh, the Democrats rejected it outright. And in turn, what they did was turn around and nominate Goldbugger Grover Cleveland. And what Grover Cleveland was trying to do was um, keep the country on a gold basis. So he was selling gold bonds, putting the people into debt. In 1894, he actually um, uses a, 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 sells the sneakily, um, sells gold bonds through a foreign, foreign syndicate uh, array, uh, arranged by Morgan and some friends, some allies. And he gets the foreigners, uh, mostly I think the French, to buy the gold bonds so he can get the gold into the United States, putting the people again in. So you're going to hear this again, this issue come up with them. So we get James Weaver, he's the candidate that year, presidential candidate. Ignatius L. Donnelly um, delivered the populist preamble. He actually um, uh, had delivered that preamble, that same one, a year before, because what was going on was the Northern and Southern alliances were meeting in separate conventions during that period um, because they couldn't agree. And but they had identical, practically identical platforms. And um, Donnelly was for the Northern Alliance uh, party, but and he delivered his preamble to that convention. But here's what he says. I've got some excerpts which are really interesting. He says, for conspiracy theorists anyway, um, the national power to create money is appropriated to enrich bondholders of vast public debt, payable in legal tender currency that's been funded in the gold-bearing bonds, thereby adding millions to the burdens of the people. Silver has been demonetized to add to the purchasing power of gold, and the supply of currency is purposely abridged to fatten usurers, bankrupt enterprise, and enslaved industry. A vast conspiracy against mankind has been organized on two continents and it's rapidly taking possession of the world. If not met and overthrown at once, it forebodes terrible social convulsions, the destruction of civilization, or the establishment of absolute despotism, which we're kind of looking at today. Yeah. Anyway, he's going, uh, Donnelly was no lightweight, I think I just showed you. He was a lawyer, a politician, an author. He was considered a, a, a good candidate for the uh, nomination. So where is he getting this? Conspiracy stuff from none other. Like he sort of does look a little conspiratorial, doesn't he? <laughs> so Delmar was a contemporary of these guys, and he was closely aligned with them, oddly enough, because he was the chair of the Silver Party in New York. Um, but anyway, he in his book, um, what's it? It's history, history of Monetary Crimes, and that was published in 1899, before all of this happened. But he was, his articles were reprinted in news, uh, newspapers, populist newspapers, and um, they would follow what he was saying, go to his, you know, his presentations and all of that. <coughs> but he's talking about, oh, I just tried to condense it, because he goes through a blow-by-blow -blow description of what was going on in terms of the foreign syndicate trying to get their, it's kind of like Stephen Zarlinga would talk about the and not with silver and gold. Um, <coughs> But he says the first thing was a newspaper war against the Greenbacks. And they were calling it, they said they weren't even money. And then they started with the gold-silver thing, playing around with that, with the crime of 73, which basically put, there was other acts in here that he goes through, but this I'm just highlighting. Uh, it put the country on a gold basis um, and got rid of silver as a currency, except in small dementia, denominations. Anyway, here's a, here's a quote from Del Mar. These acts were the issue of European intrigue and precedent. Moreover, these acts were hatched abroad and brought to our country by the treacherous people who governed the utterances of the New York world. That was the most, um, uh, well, uh, biggest New Year, uh, newspaper on the north, uh, northeastern uh, seaboard at the time. And so he goes through who the owners were of that New York world and all of that. We could do that for the media today if you want. Um, it wouldn't be hard, it'd be a short talk. Uh, anyway, um, he's, he's within this, um, 
these intrigues, he's talking about fund holders or bond holders. So they were American fin uh, financiers, bond holders, as well as uh, in the crime of 73, it's primarily centered on the French, but he talks about how all of these groups met in international conferences and um, you know, decided whether gold was gonna be money or whatever. The French wanted to get their, their two cents out of um, the United States, so that's why they opted, they said, well, the financiers don't care if we go on the gold standard because they'll make a three cents profit based on that crime of 73. So let's just go with, you know, let them demonetize uh, silver because they'll go along with it. So you get a, another uh, sketch of the period. It shows kind of what was happening in the West, which was just about everything besides the financial area, financial, you know, south of, at that time, anything south and west of that financial establishment was the West. So it's all going, the, the Eastern financiers are being extracted of their pound of flesh from, their, that one says England, but it's, um, uh, the crime of 73 was primarily the French behind that. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so I was, let's see, I was trying to get to the, this is not working very well, is it? Um, I was trying to get to um, Del Mar. Um, oh, I need to get to, it's only a couple more minutes, so it's not, not very long. More conspiracy. <laughs> if I can scroll down. I should have a mouse. Oh man, don't do the whole thing. Do you want a mouse? I can give you a mouse. I can give you a wireless mouse if you want. That was a good joke. Yeah, it was a joke. Um, I don't know, I'm almost there. I think. Oh, but maybe I'll need it because maybe it's a bad joke. Any bad joke? Any bad joke? Surely. Thank you. <laughs> so we're to, you know, Henry Lukes is telling us, he's the president of that national front, he's telling us what money is, they're in their planks, they're telling you what money is, Donnelly is telling you what's happening in the country politically, Del Mar goes blow by blow of what's going on, how the money system, monetary system, this was going on in the colonies too, um, but anyway, how the monetary system is being manipulated by these, um, well, I'll call them foreign syndicates. Um, and then we get um, the East. There was other books written. This one, Little Statesman, it, it, it's really hard to find the information about this guy. Uh, but he was a publisher. And he finished, published this book in 1895. And he's got some really good things to say. One of the, which, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, you have to do it from memory. <laughs> I can't. Well, <laughs> so he's got the, what the, what the. Um, I love that. So what Luke, what the, the state, little statesman guy was doing was telling you about the, um, uh, the greenback. That there was an exception clause. Why is it doing an introduction? It's not going to identify it. It's not going to identify the mouse? No. Oh, it's got it. What, what uh, Schulte was doing, he was talking about the greenbacks, and he's quoting um, uh, Sherman, uh, Senator Sherman. Um, uh, the Senator Sherman, uh, they, what they wanted to do, they put the exception clause on the greenbacks. The first issue of greenbacks were strictly legal tender, no, um, no exception clause. In the exception clause, they said all, all tariffs. Who knows the New all, all duties and tariffs had to be paid for in gold, so they, they made us, what they did was create a special demand for gold. And that, that meant that the, um, that the um, greenbacks depreciated against gold. 
So, they, you know, the green banks didn't depreciate, gold appreciated because of the special legal demand given to it by that exception clause. And the reason they wanted to do that was they had to figure out a way. Everybody loved the greenbacks, the first um, issue. And the reason they had to do that was to, um, so they could sell bonds. They wanted to sell bonds. Um, all right, I'll see if I can remember from memory. So and Schulte also goes into another part uh, um, where he's talking about fiat money. And he says those fiat fools don't know what they're talking about because uh, a silver dollar um, is worth a dollar, um, whether it's, uh, you know, but if you take the fiat off of it, then it's only worth 48 cents at that point because the bullion value was only, a, so the fiat is what put the value in the money. And uh, then he, he talks about, you know, the bankers want to tell us that, um, that uh, paper money, you have to have, you know, it's the bankers that can do paper money. And he says, that's, a, that's just propaganda. The, during the Civil War, we issued, uh, I don't know how many millions, 17 millions, 100 millions of it. And um, uh, to have, so soldiers could shoot down other soldiers. Why can't we issue the same thing uh, to employ poor, you know, somebody um, uh, to uh, create a public works project, build a road? like Coxie wanted to do. Um, this is okay. Oh you, oh, you got it working? Okay. Well, kind of. You hope? Mm -hmm. Maybe I just need to go a little slower? Might because you stay there. Might Might you. Yeah. <laughs> don't go. Jeremy is Jeremy in charge of that machine. Okay, a couple more down. I want to get to S. Schulte and to, to um, Del Mar. I think it's Del Mar is next. Okay, wait. Okay. All right. There's a couple other writers. We're not going to. Elizabeth Barr. Um, she quotes another congressman. He says uh, something. We ask that Wall Street, the Rothschilds, and the Barings shall no longer be um, con control our financial legislation. And what I charge that our legislation has been in the interest of the capitalist and the dealer in money. I charge that which I can prove from the record, and I challenge a successful contradiction. This is a congressman from Kansas. So there were other, there were many others that wrote a lot on this um, issue, uh, and intelligently too. The civil rights, what we get is um, uh, there was a division, that, especially after 1894. Right after this, uh, the crime of 73, you start seeing these civil rights factions within the re both Republican and Democratic Party. In 1894, um, the, um, the uh, Democrats, the, okay. So, this is on my website. You should read the, the, the last few um, slides because Del Mar, uh, so William, uh, William Jennings Bryan gets to um, the 1896 convention um, with his famous misunderstood cross of gold speech. Because in it, he says, the government should issue paper money. I stand with, the, with you know, not with the bankers, I stand with Jefferson. And so those are the relevant, you know, we think it's all about gold. No, it wasn't. It was about what the populists were saying. Um, there he is. There's Mr. Uh, uh, the Boy Order from Nebraska. Um, and he is, so the, if we can get to the next one, that's his. Okay, those, we say in our platform that uh, we believe that the right to coin and issue money is a function of government. Those who are opposed to the proposition uh, tell us the issue of paper money is a function of the, uh, of the uh, Bank. banks, and that government ought to go out of the banking business. I stand with Jefferson rather than them and tell them, as he did, the use of money is a function of government, and the bank should go out of the governing business. Now, uh, Del Mar was on hand to, to endorse William Jennings Bryan at the Chicago Convention. And um, uh, like I said, Del Mar was head of the Silver Party. And his platform for the Silver Party, um, where are we here? Oh, that's no, no, there, there was one before that. Just, okay, keep it on that one. Um, so the Silver Party, um, I wanted you to read both, uh, 
the Silver Party in particular, their plank, which says, it's almost you know, very similar to the two quotes that I give you, um, excerpts that I give you, are almost identical with what the um, Farmers Alliance are saying. We, the, the government, should, has the right and the ob obligation to issue um, money. Uh, issue and coin money, and that is what they wanted to do. That that um, uh, previous slide was the Texas State uh, Ally uh, Historical Association online. They said that uh, what the populists want to do, and this is true, they wanted to get silver, more silver, into circulation immediately because it was on the books by a 1792 statute, um, and modified after that for the ratio of gold to silver. Um, but they wanted to get that. Um, silver into circulation to increase the, the money supply, but they wanted to revamp the entire. Um, is, is that it? Yeah, they wanted to revamp the entire monetary system. Um, uh, actually, and it was a financial system because it had to do with bonds. And, and because the quote with the Silver Party will tell you, we stand on two two fronts. It's between um, gold and bonds and uh, bank money. And then on the other side is no bonds because they were not, they weren't, the populists were not at all, that one of their planks was against futures trading. They really weren't happy with that. Um, but on the other side is no bonds, um, government current, a sovereign currency, um, including the greenbacks. Uh, so they're quite paper money. The legacy of the populists is the last slide. We can get to that. Okay, so this has been written by uh, several people. James Livingston in his Origins of the Federal Reserve um, takes a whole book to, to talk about this. Um, but um, this one was the best summary I found. I liked it a lot. Unfortunately, it was I, if I found it in an article called M McCune's Monopoly. And I think he goes way off the rails when he's calling it McCune's Monopoly. It wasn't. And, um, so this article was, uh, he's from the University of Pennsylvania, and it was, the article was written in 2014. But this is what he said. The legacy of populism does not survive as merely a possibility, nor was it realized in progressive reforms. It was not, I don't care how many writers you're gonna tell us, that you're gonna cite to us that the, popula the populist melded into the pop uh, progressive, they did not. Um, so he says, instead, the legacy of populism is reflected in the constrained democracy of the American state, which restricts popular sovereignty from the economic sphere. And that's what we're working with. So you had the 1890s, remember, with Lucille, I don't know who talked about that, but Lucille was talking about this committee in, on the East, with Woodrow Wilson in the Eastern Financial Establishment. Um, you know, they're determining the education of the, of the whole, Okay, I guess so. Well, we no, I'm not sure I understand what's being expressed there. Yeah. The legacy okay. of populism does not survive as a mere possibility, nor was it realized in progressive reforms. Instead, the legacy of populism is reflected in the constrained democracy of the American state, which restricts popular sovereignty from the economic sphere. In other words, is the economic sphere the source of the restriction of the constraining American democracy. Well, uh, the way I read it was that um, now, from now on, the populace wanted to participate in the economic system. And what happened was their legacy got subverted by the money power. And instead, what we got was this um, uh, sovereignty. We don't have, you know, remember the, um, what's his name? McClay from mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. He's talking about it's, it has nothing to do with republicanism. And that's basically what this guy said. What the populists were about was republicanism, that they wanted to participate in um, the economic system, have a voice in that, as well as um, in the political system. Instead, they were, because they were so successful, they were actually incredibly successful. You know, I have newspaper articles, even in South Dakota. McKinley wins by a landslide. The, the gold buggers have won, and yada, yada, yada. And uh, that, that's not true. Um, it was incredibly close, uh, even, you know, the, so, um, right. I, I mean, a, a change of votes, one author I read um, 
about Henry Luce, said that if there was a, a you know change, a, a shift over of like 19,000 votes in just five states, uh, Bryan would have won. And what he was getting, the pushback he was getting, was from, and he did an awful lot of campaigning in the East. What the, what was happening was the, um, uh, well, one source said, and I think he's partly right, that uh, Brian's uh, Brian was done in by the um, McKinley um, media machine uh, because they pumped in a lot of money, pamphlets, I have tons of pamphlets. They shipped in um, train loads free of people to listen to McKinley. Um, the employers <coughs> would tell. <coughs> Well, I think um, that Jerry's losing her voice now, so she probably can't answer to her questions <laughs> now. But I, I want to really thank Jerry for a fantastic presentation. Yeah, yeah. huge amount of research has gone into that, and those quotes are worth their weight in gold, excuse the pun. <laughs> because um, what, it shows, <laughs> what it shows to me is that the, the US, America has such a rich history of this monetary knowledge, more so than any other country, I think. I don't think there's any other country that's got this level of knowledge and experience with monetary system and monetary reform history, um, not, certainly not in any of the European countries right. and, and not in the UK. Um, and so basically what these guys were saying is basically what we're, we're saying now and it's basically what they're advocating is what's in the Need Act and you know, sovereign money proposals. And um, well, it's, it's encouraging, but it's also um, a, 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 um, another example of how the vested interests opposed that movement and posh it, which it wasn't that long ago, you know, the late 1800s, 1890s, it's not that long ago. And it's like, there's been cultural amnesia since then with a relentless propaganda. Because a lot of people, you know, these organizations have memberships of millions and, and um, you know, organized labor, they understood these issues as well. Howie Hawkins gave a talk about that at um, the Eastern Economic Association Conference in, um, earlier this year, the AMI session, um, the session that AMI organised. And um, so there's a rich history and, you know, these good ideas have been around for a long time and um, we, we really owe it to, to our, our forebears to really um, use, tap into that and to, to reinvigorate the understanding and, and knowledge and, and um, passion. And, you know, it is, it is emotional. Thing, huh? <laughs> that was it's dry in here or something was yeah. something got in the middle of my throat. So uh, okay, so is your is your voice recovered? Yeah. So do you just want to say something? Yeah, I gotta say yeah. something about what you're saying. How important it is to keep this history alive. Yeah. Right. So important because it will allow the people this in the current to think. They have to know this in order to be able to think about the money. Right. 
Right. Put it in your bibliography. <laughs> some of their books uh, were really important. We went. I, I did. I took a segment um, for our research parity research group on um, um, what was it, the hundred cent dollar, and so I was going through some of the the writings of one of the populists, Dunning, Nelson Dunning, from his book called Philosophy of Price. So, um, and he talks about. I mean, he's really clear. He's uh, you know excellent in that book. There are several others. Coins Financial School goes through the gold and silver. It was written by a lawyer. Um, so he, he takes you step by step, uh, citing um, uh, the you know, uh, legal statutes and all of that. So they knew what they were talking about, and yet they, they were forgotten on purpose quickly, I think. Uh, and yet, maybe because, so they, we can have a replay, because what was going on, you saw that 100 cent dollar and what was happening to the farmers and labor. Sure. They, were, they were together, the Knights of Labor, they, they worked together a lot. They did have a, a parting of the ways with uh, Henry George over trade. Um, so uh, the, Henry George just stayed by himself over that. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, um, I think that the, drum, uh, the, the money power started collecting himself and, themselves and they started attacking that American Economics Association. Um, so that's, that's what I'm saying. It's because they were trying to find ways to support what the populists were saying, and they marginalized them, belittled them, you know, and, and they were told, they were the, I forget what the name of the other group was, uh, and then they started other economics associations after that. So the populists really, after, after 1896, they, they lost steam, but it was because of uh, that McKinley media machine. McKinley, was, uh, he had funds. Once he switched, he said, okay, I'll support the gold, you know, the gold basis for the dollar. Once he did, they gave him three and a half million dollars. Brian had, uh, at most, 500,000. The McKinley machine paid for trainloads of people to come listen to McKinley on his uh, front porch campaigns. Brian went, I think, 18,000 miles and he spent a lot of time on the, on, with the Eastern labor, labor groups. Um, and even at that, he, and then he, you know, he did have, I think um, Del Mar probably helped him write that uh, part about the silver plank um, at that convention. Anyway, it was an important, it is an important I just want you, to, you, you people out there to help me. There's a, there's a famous quote that who, whoever controls the history controls the present? Is there is some quote like that? George Orwell. <laughs> is that George Orwell? I, yeah, whoever controls the past controls the present. Controls the present whoever controls That's the present, it. Controls whoever the controls the past controls the present. The present. And whoever controls the present controls the future. Right, yeah. Very good, Sue. Yep. Okay. Okay. Time to eat. Okay, thank you very so much. Great job. Great job.